Great, hello, thank you all for joining us. Um, many of you know me, I'm Matthew Spangler, Professor of Performance Studies here at San Jose State. Uh, and I'm joined today by three people I'd like to introduce, then I'll step aside and hand the microphone off to them, so to speak. Uh, first is Mary Manning. Uh, Mary was at the center of the Dunn Store's anti-apartheid strike in Dublin, Ireland, which lasted from 1984 uh, to 1987. Uh, next is Sinead O'Brien. Uh, Sinead, if you could wave or something, we'll know who everybody is here. Uh, <laughs> Sinead is an Irish author and documentary maker, and together with Mary, they wrote Striking Back, the untold story of an anti-apartheid striker, this book in my hand. Uh, the book recounts the events of the Dunn Store's anti-apartheid strike. And finally is Miles Dungan. Miles is a historian, author, journalist, and teacher based in Ireland. Among other things, Miles is also the presenter of the weekly history program on Dublin's RTE radio, and he will be interviewing Mary and Sinead about the strike and about their book. So thank you all for being here. And at this point, let me uh, turn it over to Miles. Matt, thank you very much indeed. And uh, Sinead and Mary, um, you're very welcome and thanks for, uh, for joining us today. Um, I'm going to be talking mostly in the beginning to Mary, and then we'll bring in Sinead to talk about the, the collaboration on the writing of the book. But uh, Mary, thanks to Matt holding up a copy of the book, uh, we now know from the front cover what you looked like back <laughs> in 1984. Um, at what point were you in your life uh, in 1984 before the controversy began. Tell us what Mary, uh, Mary Manning was like back then. Um, well, I, has, I had literally just turned 21 about a week or so before the strike started. Um, and I wasn't political at all, wasn't a member of any political party, wasn't really, didn't take much interest in politics at all. Um, more or less worked in Dunn's, which is a, was a supermarket in, in Ireland, still is. Um, and like any kind of 20, 21 year old work to kind of go out for the weekends and that was that was my life then. And Dunn Stores itself, what was it like to work in? It was horrendous. I mean it's it's they employ mainly women and mainly young women and the management are mainly men. Um, they have this kind of you, I mean they have these stupid rules that we were just before the strike we were trying to actually get a meeting to talk to them about some of the rules like you um, sit beside someone all day, but you couldn't call them by their first name. You had to call them Mr. or Miss. You couldn't be over or under on your register by so much within some so a time frame, or you'd be called up to the office and, and uh, given some sort of reprimand. The time you go into the toilets, like if you were on a register, there might be ten people on a register, and if you want to go to the to the bathroom, you'd have to put your name on a list and wait until people got what they call a relief. So someone would come down and relieve someone off a till and then you'd get a turn when they came back down. So just these stupid rules that just kind of, um, they didn't like people. You couldn't talk to management. You couldn't be friendly with the management. You couldn't call them by their first name. So it was kind of a very um, authoritarian place to work. And as I said, it was mainly women and mainly young women that worked there and still there at the moment as well. Now, we're basically talking to an American audience, which perhaps wouldn't be that familiar with the concept of a trade union, certainly not these days, um, you know, with outside of uh, certain industries and the public service. But, you know, in even though it was a supermarket, even though it was very much in the private sector, you were a member of a, of a union. And whether they liked to or not, Dunn Stores recognized that union or negotiated with that union. Well, they, they did it under protest. They didn't really, I mean, there was probably 50 staff, 40 or 50 staff in, in the Henry Street Bank, which is where I was. And I'd say at the time, there was probably about 25, 30 members of the union. Um, the management didn't like us being me members of the union, but you really, you had to be. It was your only kind of um, security that you had to work in there because um, it was through the union negotiations that they, they, you know, they negotiated for us for pay rises and stuff like that. You just wouldn't, they wouldn't entertain the staff done. Hmm. So remind us of how a couple of pieces of outspan fruit changed your life and also tr changed Irish trade union history in the process. 
Well, what happened was Air Union, it was IDATU at the time, it's, it's now called Mandate, they sent around a policy that had been passed at the AGM at April of that year um, in support of Black South Africa to, uh, calling for a boycott of South African goods. So asking people not to sell them, not to, to um, the union members not to handle them. Um, so that policy came into our store, was paper that came into our store and Karen Guerin, who was the uh, shop steward, um, called us all and we, we had a meeting about it and we talked about it and said we didn't know really what was going on but as, as I said to you because we'd had so much hassle in the store prior to this it was like a okay well this is one more thing we can get up their noses with yes. so we had to go around and find out what actually was from South Africa because it was a, a grocery store so it was mainly as you said outspan it's outspan fruit and veg and some tinned fruit um, so we started to we started to refuse to sell them. The people who are members of the union started to refuse to sell them at the tills and um, refused to pack them. The whole we wouldn't touch them. And of course, once management got word of this, they started to call us up to the office to find out what we were going to do and call us up either individually or with, with Karen, the shop steward, or, and try and intimidate us. And this happened for a couple of days before the actual strike started. And we were given choices. They never told us what, what kind of action they were going to take, but it was going to be serious consequences is what they told us it was going to be. And what they did then was the union members who had said that they were going to continue to refuse to handle the goods were put on registers with management standing behind and um, watching kind of what was going on. And this woman came up to me with two Elthorn grapefruit and I told her that um, it was their union policy. As I said, didn't even know how to pronounce apartheid at the time, really. Um, and told her that we were, it was union policy and we were refusing to handle South African goods. And she was fine with it, but there was a manager standing right behind me. And she just said to me, close off your till and come up to the office. And once I went up to the office, they gave me a few minutes to reconsider. Um, and once I said I was going to continue to, hand, to refuse to handle them, they told me I was suspended indefinitely. And that led to a to a walkout, to a strike. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, 10 of us. It was 11 of us, beginning with 10 of us, nine women and one man, um, all kind of under, all under the age of about 25. Most was some of them under 20. Um, so we started to pick it. We, we obviously went up to our trade union and got um, placards and started to pick it. But it was, it was a learning process out on the picket line because as I said, we didn't really know what was happening in South Africa at the time. It was more of an up yours to done so that we were, we started to refuse to handle. So once we were out on the picket line, we started to learn what was going on in South Africa. And it became for us, it became much more than a policy. I mean, the piece of paper that was written on was nothing until we actually acted on it. Um, and once we kind of started to realize what was happening in South Africa, um, it became something that we, we had to do. It was, it was something that we kind of felt so strongly about that we couldn't kind of go back to work and just start to handle the goods again. Now, they thought World War I would be over by Christmas and they thought <laughs> COVID would be gone by the summer of uh, 2020. Did you think the strike would be over by the, the weekend and you'd be able to go to, you'd, you'd be able to get to the disco? Yeah, well, I mean, basically it was a lovely sunny day. It was the middle of, of the summer in Ireland. And we thought, great, we'd be out and out for a couple of weeks, maybe at the most. I mean, we thought even two weeks, we thought it was going to be a long time to be out. And it was really sunny. And we thought, OK, we could have a couple of weeks holidays. It would be great. So no intention, no, no thoughts that it was going to go on any longer than that. And how much support did you get uh, from your, your union? Because you were following a union directive. Yeah, I mean, we had we had support from our union in that they paid us strike pay. We received £21 a week, which we got a rise at some stage to £23. So, um, but I think the trade union movement as a whole didn't really support us. And our own union in, in the end didn't either. But um, it was kind of, I think, because we were acting on something that was, people had protested against what was happening in South Africa for years. And because we were now boycotting it we, we kind of took I don't know whether they, they took they paid much um the trade union movement anyway didn't they wouldn't give us an all-out picket so other union members were passing their picket like delivering into the store um it was very hard for us to try and get any kind of like support from 
in that way. We had individual members from other trade unions come over and pick it with us, but as a whole, it was, it was hard to try and muster up some support. And how much support did you get from your fellow workers in Dunn stores, some of whom, as you say, would have been union members? Yeah, I, um, as I said, there's only 10 of us who actually stayed out in strike. So um, it kind of varied. I mean, some of them were just put the head down and walked by us, but some of them were very nasty. I mean, the, the canteen was three store flights upstairs um, from where we were picketing. They used to throw things out the window at us when we were on the picket line and they'd kind of wave their wage packets as they were walking by and kind of, you know, talk about what they were going to buy for Christmas and this kind of thing. So they were, um, some of them were pretty nasty now, last year than others, but it was, and it was, it was weird because as I said, I was only 21, had turned 21 about a week or so before the strike. And most of the people who were, who had gone back to work were at my 21st and were what I would have called friends prior to this. So it was very hard to kind of deal with that too. And how much personal stress and pressure then were you under as the strike dragged on and on and on? Well, I think um, because a lot of people didn't know about what was happening, they thought we were mad to be on a picket line and picketing for something that was on strike for something that was, um, as they said, nothing to do with us. And like, you know, you're, you're on strike for people who are thousands of miles away. And why don't you go on strike for things that happened up in Northern Ireland? Like all different reasons that, a lot of it was people who couldn't understand why we were on strike. Um, and then I had as well, because my name was associated, because I was the one who was suspended, whenever more or less whenever anything was, was on about the strike, my name was mentioned. So I had the added pressure. My, my parents were worried about, not like, I mean, they supported me, but they were worried about what was going to happen. And like 1984 in Ireland, there was a recession. And being a member of a trade union wasn't necessarily a good thing, but being on strike for someone who was something that, that was like thousands of miles away was totally mystified to people altogether. As you say, I mean, the two names that, I mean, I was would have been working as a journalist at the time, the two names that stuck at the time and still stick in my head in relation to uh, the Dunn store strike were, are Mary Manning and Karen Gearan. So... Yeah. How how did you deal with the or how did you handle the kind of instant celebrity, uh, as it were? Because there there are those who who would have absolutely loved it. Uh, what about you? No, <laughs> I never liked, and I still don't. I still don't like doing interviews. I mean, I find it very uncomfortable. I suppose it's not something that I'd normally do, so it's not. I don't feel very comfortable doing interviews of that. And I felt it even worse when I was twenty one years old. So I've got a bit older now, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, I, like I suppose what happened was. When, when journalists came down to the picket line, it was because my name was mentioned, they wanted to speak to me. And then whoever was the kind of loudest then got next. So Karen was the shop steward, so she would have been interviewed as well a good bit. And then, I mean, the others would have done some some meetings, but they're probably the same as himself, wouldn't have been used to doing that. It wouldn't have been something that we were kind of, had you know ever thought of, thought of doing. So it was an unnatural thing for us to be doing, so. And what impact was it having on your family? And were you concerned about the impact that it was having on your family? Um, I, it was kind of, it was tough, as I said, because my name was mentioned and because in 1984, like it was, um, it, it, to be a member of a trade union in a recession and to lose your job because of someone who is thousands of miles away. Although my parents would have supported me in that I lived at home all the time, they were genuinely worried. I mean, and rightly so, because as they, they said to me during it, like, um, you know, your name was always mentioned, you're never going to get a job again, which was true, because I mean, once you kind of were associated with it, it was just something, as I said, people didn't like the idea of being in trade union. So, um, and then my mother would have had her own, I mean, that's part of the book as well. My mother would have had her own issues and that would have impacted on her and my life as well at the time. So I was dealing with that as well. Uh, were there tensions and divisions amongst this core group of, you know, fewer than, than a dozen strikers? Or was it, you know, solidarity uh, all the way, sisters and one brother obviously one doing brother. it themselves? Yeah, no, I mean, like, we were very, very, um, we were very solid as a group and still are. Like, we still have a, a good bond together now. I think when you go through something like that, we'll either split or we won't, do you know what I mean? And I think because the group was so small, we knew that we had to rely on each other. I think had it been maybe 20, 25 people, there might have been divisions in, in the, the, the strikers, but 
because there were so few of us, we knew that the only way was to was stick together. Like that was, and even though we might have had like argument, not arguments, but like differences of opinion behind the scenes, we never let it be shown. Like once we were out in the public, because we knew we couldn't do it. Now, 1980s would not have been a great period for women in Ireland. I mean, arguably no period is a great period for women in yeah. Ireland, certainly not the 1980s. I mean, you'd had the, uh, you know, the, the previous year, you had the, uh, the abortion referendum when uh, abortion became unconstitutional. It was already illegal. Um, so in terms of women's rights, that wasn't exactly, a, uh, you know, progress. Do you think it made a difference that the, the vast majority of this cohort of strikers were female. And not only that, but as you say, were young women as well, that you would have been looked down on for that, for both of those reasons. Yeah, definitely. And I think the fact that we were working class as well. I mean, we were reported by journalists as being silly young women. I mean, forgetting about Tommy, who was there, but that, that was how we were, were portrayed in the press. And a lot of the times that we we didn't know what we were talking about and that we were being led by the union was leading us and telling us what to do. And um, so it was like, they, like they didn't kind of, they didn't give us any, um, they didn't believe that we were, we actually believed in what we were doing and that it was us who like the union tried to push, put us back, back to work, but we wouldn't go back. So um, definitely because we were women and I think definitely because we were working class women that were most of us were from working class areas. So it's, it was that definitely had a, um, People didn't take us as seriously as, let's say, someone from a better part of, of Dublin or an, an male would have been taken, I think. Um, one of the other names that I associate with the strike, the only other name in reality, is uh, Brendan Archibald. Brendan Archibald was a, an, a union official with IDAT. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he, again, is somebody I associate. Is he, do you, did you see him? Do you still see him as having been one of the good guys? Oh, definitely, a hundred percent. I mean, that's like, I think him and Tommy are the two unsung heroes of the, of the strike really, because Tommy, for the reason that he gets like written out of, of history all the time. Um, and Brendan, who put his own job on, on the line for us. I mean, he, he, he did things for us when we were on strike that he was getting into trouble for at work and, um, he was a, a supporter in that he came down when, it, when he wasn't at work so he was like all the way through it I think he only for him he fought air corner like all the time um, and I think only for Brendan and to me Brendan is what I would class as a true union official mm. um, there are plenty of people call themselves that but mm. um, now the strike as it went on it became a kind of a national cause celebre and it was taken up by a number of individuals, by a number of organizations. Were you were you grateful for that support or did you ever think, what a shower of middle class posers? I think we, we kind of learned quickly enough that we needed to get um, the media on board. And so any way that we could do it like was was okay with us. I mean, like we kind of we, we knew that the only way to kind of um, to progress the strike or to get anything to happen was to get the government involved and they were just sitting back and saying nothing because we it kind of came fairly obvious fairly quickly that Duns weren't going to meet us and weren't going to um, back down and weren't going to even meet with the union so we had to try and put pressure on the government to try and get involved and um, so any kind of media attention that we could get um, so like when people came down and tried to take over, like no one, people did try and take over. And we always said that what we do is we made a pact together that we wouldn't join any um, political party because that would have been used as though they were being like run by whatever party they decided. Um, but we were fairly cluey in that we, we knew, so we kind of copped on fairly quickly that like we needed the media on board, but we need to be able to do our own thing as well and to, to put our view forward. And not to be let it taken over by someone. Now it dragged on for almost three years. What was it that eventually brought the strike to an end? Well, what happened was, I mean, I think one of the big influences of it was was Bishop Tutu inviting us over to South Africa. Um, we went over initially in 1985, and we were turned away at the airport and sent back to London. Um, we were actually held for about 12 hours in the airport in South Africa. And at that stage, I mean, this is before the time of mobile phones, before the time of emails, nobody knew where we were. So 
we had last been heard of in London, where we were told we were going to be turned back, we weren't going to be let on the plane first. Um, and then we were turned back in South Africa after, after the flight over. So according to everybody in Ireland, they thought we were in still in London in, in Heathrow Airport. Um, but it was one of the worst things that they did because instead of just letting us into South Africa and maybe getting a little bit of publicity from the tour, what we were going to see, it became an international thing. Like we were front page of the papers. So everybody was wondering, well, why, what have they got to hide that they won't let these people in who are shop workers? Um, like what are they afraid of? So that brought a lot of media attention to it. And once that started to happen then, um, the government had to do something, had to try and be seen to be involved anyway. And eventually they um, brought in, a, they, they took, we had to lift the picket for about a year, you know, or eight months, I think it was. Um, while well, they thought about, they brought in um, a law where they banned the importation of South African fruit and veg, um, which meant that we wouldn't have to handle them, but it took a while for to get them off the, off the shelves in Ireland anyway. Um, so we once it, it, that 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 law came in, in in January, I think it was, and then it took until April before we were able to go back. April nineteen eighty seven before we were able to go back to work. What was it like to go back? <laughs> it was weird. It was as weird going back out as it was going kind of being on the strike because, you, like, in two and a half years, you've you've changed completely. Like you've 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 grown a lot and you've you've um, experienced things that you would have never experienced had you been working and done. So. To go back there and as well as that you're going back with people who you knew didn't like you so and you knew we we're going to get out get you out if you could so it was it was strange but it was i mean i knew at that stage i knew i was never going to get a job in ireland or wasn't going to get a job in ireland for a long time so i had made up my mind at that stage i was going to go and live in australia for a while so i was literally only going back to duns just to get enough money to go um but like I mean, Tom McCarran, like they, they, they um, she got, eventually got sacked after going back to work for uh, till discrepancies, which was just like they, it was constructive dismissal. And she won her case. She brought it to the labour court and won her case, but she still didn't mean anything. So we all found it very hard to try and get a job after it. Mm. How did the whole experience change you? Personally, I mean, you've already said one of the things was that you had learned so much and you had experienced so much. But, uh, you know, how were you different uh, in 1987 than you had been in 1984? I suppose I wasn't going around in my own little bubble. I mean, at the time before, like the strike started, you were, as I said, you were interested in going out the weekends. And um, that was about as much as you kind of thought about. But um once after the strike, I became much more interested in what was happening worldwide and around the world. And I didn't, I mean, I've never, I've never kind of gone into politics after it and never would have done either. But I still, I wouldn't have been as interested in things that are happening as I would have been, like had it had the strike not happened. Yeah. It made me much more aware of stuff that was happening and, and seeing different injustices around the world as well that you wouldn't have noticed before. Okay, let me bring in your collaborator on striking back, Sinead, at this stage. Sinead, um, when did you and Mary begin to collaborate on the project that became the book Striking Back? Um, well, I, I'd first done a documentary called Blood Fruit and that, so that was about the whole strike, but it wasn't about any, it wasn't about any individual. So it was about the whole strike and it was actually a huge opportunity to I suppose, research the whole strike in a way that had never been done before. And a lot of the time I was actually finding out information that even the strikers didn't know. Like I'd be telling them stuff that would have happened behind the scenes, you know, certain, you know, what it's like years, 20 years, 25 years, sometimes you, they wait before they release government papers. So all sorts of stuff, I was able to do that. So I kind of was able to put the whole thing together and then there was, uh, another character, Nimrod, who would have been very important to the strikers. So he was a character that was in the documentary. And then me and Mary, we went, me and Mary and Karen Gearan actually all went to America together. And we were actually in Washington and we were doing a screen, we were doing a few screenings in New York and Washington, but we were, when we were in Washington, me and Mary kind of spent a bit of time together because we were going to see musicians or museums. And she just told me the story about her own mother. And her, I'll let you, I'll let Mary tell that story herself because that's her own personal story. And 
at that point, I'd already written a nonfiction book and I'd always maybe wanted to write another one. And I didn't really want to write one on just the strike because I felt that had been so well covered in not just the documentary, but also in the general Irish media. And then when Mary told me the story about her mother, I was like, oh my God, because I, I was very taken by the story of the strike because as you had mentioned earlier, it was it really involving young women and Tommy, obviously. And then, you know, I felt like Mary's own personal story really was another side of, I suppose, Ireland's horrendous history with women. So that's really when I started hassling her a lot. <laughs> Um, okay, well, seeing as how you've raised that particular hair, let me go back to Mary and uh, just, you know, tell us a little bit about, Mary, the story of your mother, which features so prominently in the book and also the, the adaptation, the, the theatre adaptation. Yeah, well, um, my mother was, was she, she always told us that she was brought up by cousins in a certain part of Dublin. Um, and that's what I believed until I was probably eight or nine, I'd say, or about to eight, I'd say. And this woman knocked on the door and just said, is your mother there? And my mother answered the door. And I, I kind of knew there was something wrong, but it was then later on, I'd asked my mother, things that she told me didn't add up. And basically what had happened was she would, had been, her mother had had her in 1930. Um, and she was put into one of the industrial schools. She was like put into an, in, um, Golden Bridge in Dublin. Um, and she was, because her mother wasn't married, her mother was only 18 when she had her. Um, and in Ireland in 1930, that was like a, a big no-no. Which is, so, um, so for a long time, she never met her mother and hadn't met her until the day that she knocked on the door. So my mother was in her 30s before she met her. Um, she knew who she was or she knew where she, she, that she lived or because she had been brought up by a relation of hers. She was taken out of Golden Bridge at about eight or about 10 or 11 and um, brought to live in her aunt's house, some distant relative. We never got to how they were um, actually related. But my mother had been married and had the three, I have two older brothers and um, did, hadn't met her mother and her mother just knocked on the door one day out of the blue and she had this relationship with her that she would she lived in Cork um, and we I remember going down to Cork as a child down to Mallow but my mother couldn't call it she used to my mother used to tell me that it was your it was your aunt Molly is my aunt Molly she never called her by her her name she couldn't um call her her mother um so when I got older, she told me like more of the story, and um, she um, she didn't tell my two brothers for some reason. I don't know why, but she didn't tell them. I had to tell them when she died. But she was brought up um, by a cousin who her, her her cousin and her two brothers, and um, not knowing her mother, I think because once she met my father and she married my dad. I think she used to say to me that had she not told my dad the story, I mean, I suppose in her head, I suppose it was it was something bigger than I kind of thought it was. I mean, she she um, thought that my father was a saint from American or nearly because of, of her background. Um, but she was she remembers being fostered out to different houses when she was younger. And she remembers kind of people who she was fostered to, the names of people she was fostered to. But when her mother, when she did eventually have a relationship with her mother, she was never allowed to call her by her name. And then when she died, when Molly died and my mother went down to the funeral, um, she wasn't allowed to tell even the people at the funeral who she was. Molly had married and had never had any other children, but still my mother, mother couldn't claim her. And I think my mother had, this is what she wanted. She wanted to be known as her daughter. I mean, she had no other, like her, she never knew her father. And she eventually had like a lot of um, mental health issues. And what her did, she she um, she had a nervous breakdown because of what the way after the funeral when the funeral happened, um, she was told like more or less told not to stop crying, stop making a show of yourself. Nobody here knows who you are. Um, so that had a big effect on her. And then she wanted her mother's wedding ring, and she wrote to her aunt, and her aunt told her that she, her mother had been buried with it. And then about six months later, I think it was, 
um, a matchbox arrived, a, a package arrived for a matchbox there and she opened it and it was her mother's wedding ring. And I think that probably had, um, that m meant more to her because it, even though she didn't get uh, recognized as, as being her mother's daughter, this was the recognition that she wanted. She wanted something of her mother's to, to um, remember her by. So it had, that had a big effect on my mother and the way she kind of, she lived her life. I mean, and that was, I suppose, when I look back on it, that was why she was so worried about me because um, name, I suppose, was everything to her. So she was worried about that my name was going to be kind of known for some wrong reason, the way she looked at it. Like, um, so I think it kind of, it, it made, being when the strike happened it made it harder for me then to deal because she I knew she had gone through all of this this had been a few years before the strike started so it was hard to try and but there was a lot of kind of um significance of what was happening that like the, because as you said the way women were treated um, and the way we were being treated like we were being told more or less to you know sit down and shut up and stay quiet sort of thing and you could see the comparisons between the two so I think because of that, it did have a big effect on me. It did have a, a kind of, um, it made me stronger, I think, rather than sitting back and, 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 you know, being left in the corner. And Sinead, when you talked to Mary and said, look, I want to tell your story, but a large part of your story is also your mother's story. Were you pushing against an open door or was there resistance? I mean, a little bit. I don't know whether there was really re resistance. I think it was more maybe kind of like, I can't really, I guess that's a question for Mary. I can't really remember, I'm gonna be honest. I think, yes, I think she probably, I probably, but generally when you're working with anybody, you need to kind of give, persuade them because it's not like just, you know, Mary isn't trying to be a celebrity and most people who I work with aren't trying to be a celebrity. They're probably people who have done something genuinely brilliant in their lives and they want to make sure their story is told correctly. So I think because I'd already done the documentary, she knew that I was going, that end of things were not going to be messed up. And I think at some point, I think you trusted me, didn't you? Yeah, I, I mean, I think just on the reason probably why I, because I've been asked over the years to do a book and even Brendan, she rang me out one year and tried to introduce him to someone who wanted to do a book. But I always kind of thought that the, the story of the strike was everybody's story, all the strikers' story. But I think I've always felt that my mother should have been allowed to say who she was. And I suppose with Sinead looking at it from the angle of my mother, bringing my mother's story into it, it gave me an opportunity, even though my mom has passed away since, to make her name known, to make like to make it known who that Josephine was the daughter of, of Molly. And you know, and that it kind of it was that was what persuaded me to actually do the book in the end. And Sinead, did you need to go back to any of the other strikers in order to help get their assistance in telling Mary's uh, story? No, not at all, because you see, I'd already into the yeah. the only in the book, the strike is told from Mary's point of view, but I'd already done the whole strike, do you know what I mean? So I didn't need to consult with Mary about the strike. The Mary's personal story, she had never told any of the strikers. When she told me in America, I would think I was only the second person or third person she'd ever told the story to. I think the first person you told was Dave, wasn't it, your partner? And yeah, Dave, yeah, and, Dave, yeah. It just, it was, and it was like that, it wasn't something that I was ashamed of, it was just something that we never talked about in the house, it was just never talked about in there, it's like when, once kind of Molly died, that was it, it was never talked about really again. Um, just can I ask you, how did you both respond then when you saw what uh, Matt and Kelly, Matt Spangler and Kelly Hughes had done with the book when the first act of their adaptation was presented at the Hinterland Festival in, in June uh, 2019. How did you both respond? How did you react to what was going on in front of you? Well, Mary bald cry. Yeah. <laughs> and everybody that. who was with me bald crying, <laughs> except my brother Brian, he didn't. <laughs> but yeah I, yeah, I just found it very emotional watching it. Like it's, it's, and I mean, not probably, as again, not so much the story of the strike, but my own mother's story to see it being told, like I think it's, it was very emotional. I found it very emotional. 
Are you both and I, I liked actually, I was, I was going to say, I actually, I liked the way, Mary, I loved the way Mary's story was told. I have to say they did a, since did another performance of it down the pavilion in Dunnery. Did you see that, Miles? Yeah, yeah, online. I found and, you know, I found that amazing. And the first one as well. But I really like the way the strike was handled. I just think it's brilliant. It's so vibrant and it's so kind of like, it's kind of like, you know, this whole kind of, it, 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 the two things, you know, Mary's mother's story is so emotional and it's so incredibly kind of like, if it was all just that story, it would be too much. And then there's just this energy coming off the strikers. It's just, that's how I would have seen them, you know? And I think that's, you know, this whole kind of idea that they were all these silly women. It's all, that will never be thought of again for anybody who goes and sees the play. Well, hopefully you're both looking forward to seeing Act Two in uh, Hinterland in 2020. And, uh, and also, I think the, 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 uh, the big bad wolf will possibly appear in Act Two. I think uh, there are plans to unleash Ben Dunn uh, <laughs> on, the, uh, <laughs> on the audience in Act Two. I'm not sure, but uh, perhaps Matt can uh, confirm that. Uh, uh, Mary and Sinead, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure and a privilege, uh, uh, as always, to, to talk to both of you. And I will hand it back to Professor Spangler. Thanks, Miles. Thanks, Miles. Great. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you all very much uh, for being here and um, doing this. Um, we're very grateful that you've taken the time to do this. And for people watching this, if, if you haven't realized it already, uh, these three people are in Ireland. Uh, so they are eight hours ahead of where I'm at here in California. And so I'm especially grateful that they've taken time out of their evening uh, to be able to have this conversation with us. Uh, so again, thank you all very much. And uh, we'll see you down the road. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Matt.